Hi there, my name is Jonathan Weiner. I'm here at Isotope in our critical listening room uh, in the Cambridge campus. And welcome to episode one of our masterclass we are calling, Are You Listening? And this first week, we're going to be talking about audio mastering basics. I'm going to spend a little time kind of laying out a little bit about what mastering is, what the discipline is, that hopefully will provide a little context for what we'll be talking about in subsequent episodes. I invite you to look at our website, take a look at all of our blogs, other educational materials. I expect everybody's here because they want to understand either how to make their stuff sound better or how to get it out into the world in good shape, which is maybe a lead into what mastering is in the first place. So so I hope you find it interesting. Let's dive right into audio mastering basics. Before I start spitting out lots and lots of words about mastering, let's do a little listening. We've got some examples for you to listen to. When you're engaged in mastering, ultimately you're trying to make decisions about whether to change something, whether it needs to sound different in one way or another. So listen to these examples and see what you notice. <laughs> So what did you just hear? If you listen to the first version of the song and the second version of the song, they sound different in what way? Obviously one's louder than the other, but which one is set to the right level? And is the louder one better? And in what way are they different? These are some of the things that we always need to be thinking about in mastering. The third version that you heard was the mastered version. I'd like you to go back and compare the unmastered to the mastered version and see what you notice that's different about it. I need to learn to live life. I need to learn to let go. I need to learn to love right. I need a house with an ocean view. I need to learn to live life. I need to learn to let go. I need to learn to love right. I need a house with an ocean view. Ultimately, your goal, I assume, is to get better at doing this, or at least understanding what mastering does for a track, so that we can really get into the subtle nuances and make a song sing, if you will, you know, make it sound as good as possible, and communicate whatever it is that you or the artist is trying to communicate. However, you got to start somewhere. So listen to these next two examples, and I bet that every person who's listening, no matter what platform you're listening on, will hear that something needs to change. My what have I done with my time, with my heart, with my skill, or lack thereof? When did it all begin? Since then, for me, the time's still. Tell me what kind of fate we're in. Obviously, one of those tracks had way too much low end, or at least it didn't have any top end. And the other track was way too bright. And everybody out there can recognize it. So this is one of the most basic things that we think about when we're adjusting in mastering. I assume that everybody out there has some experience mixing, and you know how hard it is dealing with balance and the color of the snare drum and the collision between the snare drum and the, the vocal and all of that. That's mixing. That's what mixing is. It's really hard to focus on that and at the same time be thinking about the tone, the shape, the tonal balance, if you will. That's what we think about as mastering. So while you're listening to that track that we just heard, you can immediately tell that's got too much bass or that's got too much treble, it's really much harder to do that when you're mixing. So this leads us to separate a little bit the mindset between the mixing engineer and the mastering engineer and why we need to approach mastering in some ways as a separate discipline, just so that you're zoomed out and looking at the forest instead of the individual trees. What is mastering? In some ways, it's a very familiar activity. It uses a lot of the, the same tools that you use in mixing. We EQ, we compress, we use limiters, we, we change level of things. But that really doesn't capture the entire activity. To me, in order to do a good job mastering, we really need to define what mastering is. The classic definition that you've probably heard is that it is the last chance to change anything about the sound of a track, but that's really only half of the activity. The second half, is getting it ready to go out into the world. And that's the part of mastering 
that involves making sure that the level is set right, making sure there's nothing wrong with the audio, making sure that it's not too bright or too dark compared to every other recording that's been made out there, and keeping in, in mind the different contexts where people might be listening to the tracks that you're going to be creating. You know, it's not just about the creativity. It's not just about the sexier part of the gig, which is the EQ and compression, and maybe you're adding a little flavor or color to a track. That second half about getting it ready so that your listener is going to be able to get the experience you want them to have, that's an essential and important part of mastering. So when we start talking about mastering, I think you'll hear both sides of that show up in how I talk about the, the work that we're going to do. When we talk about mastering, it's tempting to confuse the tools for the activity. It's entirely possible to make use of mastering technology. Isotope makes Ozone a fantastic suite of mastering tools. You can put them on your two mix when you're mixing, and you can certainly adjust level and overall tone while you're in the activity and the mindset of mixing. That is mixing. When you're mastering, you are thinking about all of the mixed decisions that you've already made in the way that they're contributing to the song. You're now thinking about the finished product and is there one more thing I need to do? Is there something I need to do to change the overall result that I've gotten to get it out into the world in good shape? So that's a way of kind of differentiating between the mixing part of the process and the mastering part of the process and I think the mindset that you inhabit when you're doing each. So while it's possible to try to master your own mixes, it's really, really hard to do them both at once. I, I often use the analogy that it's very difficult to produce your own vocals. You know, imagine being the vocalist and also having that presence of mind to understand what it is that you actually just did and could I do it better and is it in tune and is it the way I want it to sound? So I think it's, it's very much the same to try to master and mix simultaneously. All right, so level. Let's talk about level and let's talk about loudness. When we talk about level, it is how high is the peak or the average that you see on a meter in your DAW. Loudness happens here entirely, it happens in your ears and in your brain. It does not happen in your DAW. Now, of course, a lot of people are concerned about, is my track going to be loud enough? And we'll spend some time talking about that. But it's not just about what happens in the DAW, it's about making sure that it's at the right level for the distribution format. So we might set level differently for streaming services or for just playback from your hard disk. It's really important to keep those two ideas separate. If you do, it will keep you away from this idea that I just have to make something loud or louder for loudness sake. Not every genre obviously needs to be loud in the way that we think about loud. We think about loud tracks, what immediately comes to mind is something that's got a lot of distortion and edge and a lot of density in the arrangement, whether it's EDM or punk rock or, or something that's got some aggression. Other genres, acoustic music of any sort, um, but especially classical, acoustic jazz, singer-songwriter, music that's stripped down, doesn't need to be as loud, right, comparatively speaking, as other tracks and other genres need to be. So we think about genre in helping us establish a context for level and ultimately how something's going to translate out into the world compared to other genres and other tracks. But let me take it one step further. Every recording, in my way of thinking, has a what I call loudness potential to it. What is loudness potential? If you make a recording that's got a very, very strong mono component to it compared to stereo, thinking about mid versus side, right, correlated versus uncorrelated, that will change the loudness potential of your track. A mono recording, by definition, will sound louder than a very diffuse recording that's largely out of phase or has uncorrelated information. If you make a recording that has a lot of a very, very strong mid-range component, like a, a recording of a solo piccolo, and compare that to a recording of something that's got a lot of low end, like a, a tuba recording or, or a solo bass, solo tuba, I'm sure that that's the record that you're all aspiring to make. But anyway, the, the piccolo recording is by definition, all levels being equal, by definition, it's going to sound louder because of the nature of our perception and how we hear. So we need to understand something about the tone of what we're working with, 
the mono versus stereo width in order to understand the loudness potential. At some point in your work, you've probably run into a scenario where you feel like a track doesn't have as much loudness as what you would like it to have. Some of that has to do with your arranging, some of it has to do with your mixing, and then once you get it to the as good as you can, going through that entire process, mastering can try to get you across the finish line to get it as loud as a track can be without destroying it. But I guess what I'm trying to do is encourage you to start to understand the limitations uh, or the loudness potential of the audio that you're producing and know when you've crossed the line. You don't want to go over what some people like to call the sonic cliff and push something so far that it just sounds distorted and crushed and no longer good and loud. One of the things we all hunger for is rules, like always do this and never do that. And there are certain rules in mastering, down the road, so to speak. We'll get into things like dithering. You probably all understand that you don't want to go over zero dBFS without some kind of modifier or something like that to stay away from distortion. There are some physical realities also that we have to respect, like there is such a thing as making a recording with too much bass that won't translate well to lots of speaker systems, or too much top end. But there's a lot of room for creativity as well. So long as you're staying within bounds and observing good hygiene, there's a lot that we do to think about. Is there a little bit more color to add? Is there something that we can do to sweeten the recording? Can we make a chor chorus jump out a little bit more compared to the verse? So that's where the creative decisions lay in mastering. Mastering really is a game of inches and sort of gentle nudges. In a mixing context, you might find yourself taking 10 dB out in the low end in an instrument to get it to fit into the mix. Mastering moves, if you look at a mastering session, you'll notice that most of the moves were are a half a dB, a dB, maybe 2 dB at a time. 2 dB is a lot in mastering. It's a little hard to sort of get used to that. But here's a, a thought maybe to help you understand why that is. Imagine taking an EQ and making a half a dB move on a single track in your mix. Doesn't sound like very much, right? But in mastering, if we take an EQ and put it on the stereo out and make a half a dB move, it's like taking an EQ and putting it on every single channel in your mix and making that same half a dB move. And so you're, in essence, applying that same change across everything in your mix. So it has a lot more weight and carries a lot more meaning, uh, if you will, in the difference that you're making in your mix. In order to get better and learn how to get better at mastering, I would encourage you to, you know, go ahead and experiment. Try making a 10 dB change and listen to what happens. But at the end of the day, eventually you come to the point where you begin to understand what the scale of your changes should be in mastering. And most of the time, if you've got a good mix, a little bit goes a long way. Thanks for watching Are You Listening? If you want to be notified about other episodes when they come out, subscribe to the YouTube channel and then you use the little bell icon. Feel free to go to the isotope.com website. There are lots of educational materials there, free product manuals. There's the ISO sessions uh, where you can download sound samples and experiment with them yourself. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Hope you find this useful.